So one of the things that I've learned with road trips, if you're trying to save money, is um, plan ahead and either plan ahead or find an actual grocery store to buy snacks in. Yeah, yeah, Don't go sure. to the gas station. It's going to be twice as much. You know, this is like the be prepared side of me. Yep. So this has nothing to do with the fishing, but I carry all just about every kind of tool and air yep. compressor in my truck at all times so if you are headed to a campground with a skiff and and you don't have time to call and you just need to make something real quick just grab a R, like a unpowered rv site because that's going to be big enough to fit your truck yep. and, and normally there's a, a spot you can throw a tent down i think truck stops are nice especially if you're pulling a trailer again mm -hmm. they're usually easier to get in and out of because they have usually rv areas even you know where the gas side is yeah. a lot of people don't realize this but most walmarts you can actually park overnight in so one of the things that i've learned um with coolers and especially for road trips and um and even skiff trips is um don't wait till the last minute to get your cooler ready All right, guys, welcome to another edition of the Skiff Wanderer podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jameson Redding from the Road Trip Angler. That's right. Um, Jameson, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Road Trip Angler real quick? So the Road Trip Angler is a, is a television show on Valley Sports Networks. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is pretty new, about a year old, but we're putting a lot of content out. Uh, fishing adventures, traveling, uh, take my truck and a few kayaks. Uh, you know, and just travel the country, hooking up with cool people and, and their spots. Um, you know, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, how long have you guys been doing? It? Two years, you said, right? Yeah, this is second season. So uh, actually, uh, we're here at ICAST. And right. Yesterday, or no, Sunday before ICAST here uh, was the premiere of the second season. So we just finished up filming it. They're delivering it to the TV uh, or to the network now, and then we're going to start filming season three in August. So awesome. Rolling awesome. right into it. So, road trip angler. I'm assuming that you guys are road tripping. We, we don't uh, fish. We you just, just, you <laughs> just road trip. <laughs> yeah, 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 what's kind of the basis of the show? Uh, so, for over the last, like, decade or so, I've been working in the fishing industry, uh, mostly in kayak fishing. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've been doing is, is traveling uh, all these places, collecting media and content for uh, kayak brand Jackson Kayak and other brands that I've you know, kind of met people and, you know, develop partnerships and relationships with over the years. So I'm, I'm going to all these places and people are always inviting you to go fishing, right? And you're, you're getting, you never really get to uh, figure out the fishing spots, but luckily you go with somebody that's already done that. So, you know, you got a couple of days, you hit the water and it's just always really cool to me to, to meet the people um, that we fish with, but also, you know, fish different fisheries. So we pitched that idea um, as a show. Um, and so it's just me in the truck and, you know, going to these different locations and just, you know, kind of hopscotching or whatever across the country. And, yeah. You know, hanging out with different people and just uh, trying to tell their stories and share their uh, cool, unique areas and their fisheries and stuff. And you guys, I mean, you're catching everything. You're oh, not, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, I think this year we've done just about every species of bass you can catch. We've done redfish. Um, we've caught we did snook. Uh, tried to catch some tarpon, didn't happen. Um, and then we Story went to the Pacific. Yeah, right. <laughs> then we went to the Pacific Northwest and did some like rockfish and ling cod. Tried to catch halibut, didn't happen. But you know. All right, so I've only got you for a few minutes That's this morning. So we're gonna jump into. Um, if you guys, you guys that have followed me for a while, you know that I spend a lot of time on the road going to different fisheries. Um, so we're gonna break down some road trip tips. I like it. I'm gonna let you kick it off. No, oh, so road trip, well, snacks, you got to have, you know, you got to have good snacks. Yeah. No, I would say, especially when you were talking about road tripping somewhere to fish, you know, I think people sometimes are intimidated to ask other people for spots mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And uh, sometimes people don't want to share them, but a lot of times people will. And uh, so I would say my first tip would be don't be afraid to utilize social media or forums like, you know, micro skiff is one that comes to mind, but. Um, any of those forums or social media, if you have a, a following and you've got people that are you know, following what you're already doing, or if you know someone that you know lives in that area or through social media you've connected with them, don't be afraid to reach out because uh, that's where I start usually is, hey, I'm coming to this area, love to, to fish somewhere, not looking for your honey hole like drop pin location, but you know any advice 
would help and, and a lot of times people will give it to you. Yeah, no, that's I, I tell I tell people, um, I said along the same lines, if, uh, if there's a fly shop, tackle shop, go in there, you know, you're going to need, you're, no one ever remembers all their tackles, so you're right. going to be picking some stuff up and then ask the guys behind the counter, pick their brains a little bit, yep. um, see what information they're willing to give you. A lot of those guys are fishing, you know, two, three days a week, so they have a, a good insight of what's going on in the fishery at that time. Yeah, and most people are, are really willing to share their um you know some some ideas with you so mm-hmm. i mean then you can start to formulate the plan and get out yeah there. we always like as fishermen we always think that you know all of our spots are top secret we're not going to give out any information <laughs> until you start getting us talking about fishing and then yeah. it's like let me tell you everything yeah, look at this spot. Yeah. <laughs> all right what you got next oh man you're swollen right into it yeah uh, so I, another thing and i'm sure you do this as well i mean i, I tow a skiff on some of the trips i tow kayaks i always have a trailer uh, behind it but even when i don't i carry you know this is like the be prepared side of me yep. so this is nothing to do with the fishing but i carry just about every kind of tool and air yep. compressor in my truck at all times patch kit for the tires you know yep. obviously a spare um and i in several times i actually broke a leaf pack on my trailer uh, this year on my skiff trailer and so it was down on the side of the road and uh and I ended up finding a new leaf pack. I went ahead and got the stuff to repack the bearings, and I got, you know, two leaf packs, and I just dropped the axle from under the trailer on the side of the road and was able to completely repair everything because I had a, a tool kit with me. And, you know, it saved me a lot of money. It probably saved me some time. I didn't have to get it towed anywhere and all that. So, yeah, I would I would say just be prepared. Like, have, have some basic tools and oh, things yeah. that, you know, patch a tire and change a tire and, I'm not saying you should have to do axle work every time, but <laughs> <laughs> when you spend as many, I think I put a hundred thousand miles on the truck the last two years. So when you spend that much time on the road, stuff's going to happen. Like, no. And, and, uh, so like, like I used to do a bunch of off-roading and like when, when we were like over, overland kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And when we, when we would go on those trips, we would bring, uh, extra oil, like every fluid, we'd have extra fluids with us. We'd have extra belts. We'd have extra um, filters and like we had a buddy of mine throw a um, throw. Oh my goodness, I can't remember what it's called right it's now. First morning of ICAST. This is this is how it normally goes. What's the band called on the motor? Oh, I don't know. The band. Oh, oh, got it. I oh, got it. Right. Yeah. So I, we were. Um, I was. We were on a trail. I was on a trail with a buddy, and he threw a belt. And we had a spare one with us, and we were able to get them off the off the uh, trail that way. Um, but same thing, like if you're towing a skiff with you, make sure you got you know spare oil filters, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're up on your maintenance, you shouldn't need it. But the last thing you want to do is be three hours from the closest town that might have you know the right oil, yeah. and realize that you you know you sprang a leak or you don't have enough or you need to top something off. So um, yeah tools tools to fix everything yeah. truck boats trailers yeah. it's uh it can be a process but it can be the difference in you having a really good trip and you get to where you're going like you said even with the boat um you know extra fuses and stuff like yep. that because i can't tell you how many times on one of my skiffs i had the uh, tilt and tram was a separate plate because it was a 20 horsepower on the back of a little 14 foot skiff and i was always blowing the relays on that thing and so you get out there and you couldn't tram or, or lower the motor um, without having those relays. And so you know, having extra parts and pieces is, is key. always key. All right. Um, when you when you're road tripping, um, do you camp? Do you do you stay in hotels? I, I camp some for sure. I do a little bit of everything. Uh, yeah. I I do try to avoid hotels. It's it's not easy uh, to do. Um, yeah. I, I use Airbnb a lot. So if it's only one night things like airbnb don't usually make sense because of the cleaning fee and the yeah. service fees but if you're doing at two it starts to make sense if you're staying three nights in a row you can't beat an airbnb i mean it's usually safer you got parking for your rig and for your your stuff if you need to work on something you can you're yeah. not in a hotel parking lot beating and banging around on something um so i do that a lot uh there's a couple actually this is a kind of rolls right into another tip i kind of utilize a lot of technology to figure out where I'm going to stay. And I normally don't have a plan. I mean, I may know where my destination is, mm-hmm. 
and it but it may take four days like i drove from my house in north carolina uh, to washington state and it took me four days to drive that well i didn't know where i was going to stay i know a lot of people kind of want to have everything planned out we're going to drive this many miles but i just i've done it so much that i never either i never get as far as i thought i would or i, I get to that point and i'm like man i could keep going yeah and so a lot of times I'll wait till the last minute to find something in book, but I, I use Priceline uh, a lot because you know you can do the the express deals, you mm-hmm. save some money. You don't know what you're getting, but if you play the rating game and you kind of check where the area is, you can almost figure out which hotel it is. Um, and then the other thing I do is I have uh, all stays uh, for RV. Okay. It's for camping, and it's got like every single type of campground, like KOAs, like any kind of campground is on there. I'm going to check that one out. Yeah, and it's cool, too, because it also shows you, like, where rest areas are on the interstate. So it comes up as a map, so you can actually search in an area. And it'll have the state parks, the city parks, the national parks. But, yeah, any kind of campground is on there. And it's, a lot just, of times it's called All Stays. All Stays. Yeah, okay. they have a couple different um, versions. I think they have one for truckers. And, yeah, okay. Um, but the RV camping one is, is really handy for me to just, you know, try to find – a place that you know i could camp or whatever and like koas they have cabins too so like yep. if you're not wanting to set up a tent you can crash in a koa cabin she's like 30 40 bucks a night yep. so it's awesome and i mean you if, if you're camping you already have like most of those koa cabins they'll just have a mattress in there so you still got to bring a sleeping bag and a pillow but if right. you're camping like you already got it with you yeah and but you have some of them will even have bathrooms in them and yeah. so you don't have to use the bathhouse but some don't but it's uh and they have air conditioning which is key. yeah which is key <laughs> or um I've used them in the winter when it gets yep. below 30, and I know that the tent's not going to be warm enough. Um, those cabins can, they, they'll have a little bit of heat. Some of them will have heat and um, keep you warm. And then um, one of the things that I'll add is if you are road tripping with a skiff and you're going to camp, call the campground to see what the, um, what the layout is for skiff parking. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had... Uh, I did a video down in South Texas. It's called South Texas, and we didn't do that. How did you come up with that name? Um, <laughs> it was tough. <laughs> I got a guy. Uh, oh, he does your name I'll, I'll, yeah, he does all Can you my give me naming. His information? Maybe. Right. <laughs> um, no, we didn't call ahead, and we get down there, and the tent campsites. It's basically a grass field, and you just throw your tent on the middle of it, yeah. and the parking lot is not close to it. And it wasn't like a parking, like it was, it was basically like a row of truck, like of like single car parking. Yeah. So we ended up every night having to uh, unhook the trailer from the truck. Well, at least you could actually do that. I mean, I've been places where there's no trailer parking. like so At all. Yeah. And yeah. then you, you can't, you don't know that till you're there and you just get tickets and then you hope that no one ever finds you. But, um, no, I pay those. <laughs> Um, but it, like, and I would say too, though, if you are headed to a campground with a skiff and, and you don't have time to call and you just need to make something real quick, just grab a R, like a unpowered RV site. Cause that's going to be big enough to fit your truck. Yeah. And, and normally there's a, a spot you can throw a tent down. Well, the cool thing about an RV site too, if you, a lot of them will have, if you get one with power, they'll also have water. So if you're saltwater fishing and you want to rinse all your gear down, you got access yep. to water and then you can recharge your trolling motor batteries and stuff like that. So we do that a lot. I'll get an RV site um, and still camp. It's, you know, a little bit more money, but having power and having water um, on the site is, is really key and nice. Yeah. Um, all right, let's dig into, uh, you mentioned at the beginning snacks. Yeah, so I'm a pistachio guy. Big pistachio yeah, guy? Yeah, I like them. And, and I like all the flavors that you can get now. So yeah. I've been on the, uh, the salt and vinegar lately. And, <laughs> I didn't uh, even know there was yeah, like it's, different flavors of pistachio. It's a good one. And then sriracha is good. I'm hoping that, you know, that doesn't go away because sriracha is kind of hard to find right now. But. <laughs> so one of the things that I've learned with road trips, if you're trying to save money, is um, plan ahead and either plan ahead or find an actual grocery store to buy snacks in. Yeah, yeah, Don't go sure. to the gas station. It's going to be twice as much. Um, so like I, I know like my wife and I, when, when we go, we'll try to get as much snacks as we can. And normally what we'll also do is, uh, like buy a loaf of bread and sandwich stuff or yeah, PB&J yeah. stuff and, uh, you know, pull over for an hour, make sandwiches and have lunch. Yep. Um, though I will, I gotta admit, 
gas station hot dogs are oh man i will spend money it, on those every day <laughs> it gets me every time uh when i stop at like and I, so that's another you're talking about places to stop if you're going to do gas stations yeah i love truck stops absolutely like going into like a pilot or you know if you're lucky and you get a bucky's but that's a whole nother thing like they're <laughs> they're rare right but um they're not, probably not for you because you're yeah, in texas yeah they're well the they're closest, starting to get closer and closer to where i live the closest bucky's to me is two hours away wow yeah. so but there's sign there's probably a sign by you oh that says goodness. bucky's is two hours away. It's like, <laughs> but anyway i think truck stops are nice especially if you're pulling a trailer again mm -hmm. they're usually easier to get in and out of because they have usually rv areas even you know where the gas side is yep. they have uh, spots for big rvs to get in and out of they have propane a lot of them uh, so if you're an rv person and you need to refill but also if you've got your know, camp and you got to refill some propane tanks a lot of them will have propane at those so i like stopping there they have it made me think of it because they have this giant section with all those things that are not hot dogs but also near the hot dogs oh like you know? the taquitos and yeah stuff. whatever that yeah. stuff is <laughs> um one of the things with the truck stops that I've learned is um, download the app. So a lot of them have apps. My favorite, my personal favorite is Loves because when you use the Loves app, you, you can actually get 10 cents off of every gallon. And this podcast is brought to you by. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Loves, if you want to start uh, sponsoring my, my driving all over the country. It's a road trip. Like, and then a lot fun. of them too. I mean, obviously like Google Maps. In, in Apple Maps you can use to like figure out where different truck stops are. Yeah. Also that app we were to go back to the app we were talking yeah. about All States, which doesn't sponsor me either. But <laughs> I can only keep talking about it. But it is super handy because yeah. it has all the truck stops on it as well. Oh that is okay. So and then it has things like tractor supply, Walmart, uh, people don't a lot of people don't realize this, but most Walmarts you can actually park overnight in. So if you're just right. trying to crack you know, I'm not saying it's the safest place every time. Um, but on that app, what's cool is you can actually click on, you know, whatever it is, a campground, Walmart, even a rest area, and people will have reviewed it in the app. So you can actually, like, read, stayed here, asked the manager, was told to park over by the garden center, you know, pretty safe night, wanna... quiet. You know what I mean? So you can get a feel like ones like gunshots, and you're like, oh, I don't want to stay at that one. <laughs> it, but, but for real, like, you can use stuff like technology to figure that stuff out um and uh and find places and the nice thing there too if you're if you are like towing a camper or you have a way to camp in your vehicle um you can go in and get your groceries and then yep. you come back out and just park there because yeah. you can overnight park there but how do you handle how do you handle groceries on road trip so i carry i've got a big uh 65 quart uh cooler mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an orion cooler um and it's you know it's heavy duty and i will kind of pack it in sections it has dividers in it okay and so a lot of times i'll put you know, the really cold ice packs that are like you can keep stuff frozen beside of yeah like, literally um so i'll put like frozen meats and stuff that i'm going to be cooking mm -hmm. on that side and then i just kind of stagger it out to it's loud here the eye cast. yeah <laughs> but i'll stagger it out and i'll kind of have my like you know, like you mentioned bread or stuff that doesn't need to be on ice, but near ice, you know, mm -hmm. it'll be on one side. And then in the middle, um, will just be my colder stuff. Like that needs to stay colder, like eggs or whatever. So one of the things that I've learned, um, with coolers and especially for road trips and, um, and even skiff trips is, um, don't wait till the last minute to get your cooler ready. Yeah. So what I'll do is if I'm going to leave on a Friday, um, Wednesday night, Thursday morning, I will take ice packs and start putting them in the cooler. I'll make sure I have all my groceries. All my groceries, if it's frozen, it goes in the freezer. If it's if it needs to be refrigerated, it goes in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, I'll sit there with the cooler and just keep switching out ice packs, trying to get that the temperature inside nice and cool. Yeah, people so, don't realize that. I don't yeah. think because you know it's it's insulated. Right. But it's going to retain heat just as well as it does oh, yeah. cold. So you got to acclimate it, like you're yeah. saying. It's so important. And then you can get, like, tons more days. And, it, and especially, like, if you're spending money on, like, like a Yeti or an Orion or, like, some other, like, one of these, like, heavy-duty coolers that's designed to hold ice for seven yeah. days, like, part of that is getting it to the right chilled, temperature yeah. to start. Yeah. And not putting hot, like, people dump hot drinks in it. Yeah. And like, well, I don't understand why my ice melted. <laughs> well, because drinks were 75 degrees when you put them in there. All right. So now we're going to have a lesson on thermodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> but it's true though. Like people buy these expensive coolers, and I hear it all the time. Like it doesn't hold ice. I'm like, did you pre chill it? So if you have like a, a way, like I actually have a walk in cooler for for deer hunting, and yeah. and uh, me and oh. my buddies built it, which is awesome. But we'll just we'll throw the uh, coolers in there overnight, yeah. and then they're ready to go. Ready to go. All right, since we're still kind of talking about food, do you, when you're road tripping, you eating out at night or are you cooking your own? I, we try not to eat out as much as possible. Again, this is another thing. Like when you have uh, friends along the way or if you reach out to people, like you blow your mind how many people will, like have you even come stay at their house. And, yeah. You know, we've always tried to do that at our house, like keep an open door. And I, yep. and I told my wife the reason I want to do that is because, you know, when I'm traveling, people have always been so welcoming um, it's like the fishing community. It may be, maybe other communities like are like that, like overlanding communities probably a little like that. Um, but once you start kind of getting into the community of it all, like people are just like so nice and, and open. And uh, so a lot of times we try to meet up with people, cook out or whatever. Um, I will, you know, if I have to, I'll, I'll stop and get food on the, on the way or whatever and eat out. But, you know, you spend so much money doing that. Yeah. So. Uh, when I can, I cook. I carry just a small cooking set in yep. my truck and pull it out. I've got a couple of burners. Um, I actually have a, de- a deck drawer system. So one of my drawers, when you open it, it actually has the kind of camp kitchen all in it. So you can actually cook in the drawer. So I just open up my burners and go to town. That's what tailgate. <laughs> I need to. Yeah. I'm, so like I um, like that's the next step for me is like building building my truck out so that I can yeah. have a kitchen set up. I can have a um, sleeping setup so I can sleep in it. Um, but yeah, that's what we've always done too. Same thing is grab a campsite, cook up a dinner. And especially like if, you know, like most of the campsites aren't in a terrible place where it's not a, like you can go sit there and you have a beautiful view wherever you're at and, uh, and relax. Um, what, um, how far are you driving a day? Uh, so I think, you know, I have done 16, 17 hours. Yep. So if that is the, uh, that's the destination. For example, my house, I have a camp in Louisiana. It's like 14 hour drive from my house. I'll do that in a day. Um, but that's probably about as much as I want to do, especially if it's a multiple day trip. Yeah. If I, I, I'm not going to be able to sit in the truck for 16 hours a day for, for four three, straight days. No. So like I'll, I'll try to do over 10, you know, so mm-hmm. if I can get, 10 to 12 and then you know take a break and then do 10 to 12 the next day um that's usually a pretty good goal uh you know but but yeah 14 to 16 is kind of like if i can do that i'll be there i'll I'll do that just to avoid again staying in hotels um you know i don't like it yeah no i i it for me like it'll depend like if i'm going like if i'm going somewhere i will like hightail it and try to get there as quick like i think 16 hours is about pushing it yeah for my limits um but when i'm like fishing and road tripping like i try to keep everything where like if i'm going from spot to spot like where the furthest i might drive will be six hours so that you know i can get up early i'm there by noon i can scout out like if i want to put the boat in the water and scout that evening like it's not a giant deal to go do um, and then it's just like, especially if you start where you start far and you start working your way home, like yeah. it just makes the whole trip a lot easier where you're not just killing yourself. Cause even like if you're on the road for two weeks and, and you're driving 10, 12 hours every few days in between locations, like you're going to be dead at the, oh, at yeah, the end of the road trip. And you start forgetting things and leaving things behind. I don't know if you're like that, but I leave a trail. It's pretty easy to figure out where I've been. The phone chargers and just oh. random stuff. Yeah, I think <laughs> that uh, every time I leave anywhere, I end up texting some whoever I stayed with, yeah. like, "Hey, uh, I need you to send." Me. <laughs> it's, it's, here's my account at the post office. You can just, just yeah charge it. All right, you got um, any other tips? Well, I was going to ask you actually. So when you when you go to, you know you traveling to fish a lot of times we're going to places we've never been before and i mentioned don't be afraid to reach out to the locals but let's say they share some information with you but they're not coming out on the water with you how do you approach uh figuring that body of water out when you maybe only have like a day or two days to spend f- uh, fishing that area yeah so what like where i start is um where i start is google looking up where a boat ramp is there you go. I mean, well, that's that does, that, that's, keep, keep that's going to be a key component. part of getting on the water. 
Um, and then I'll go from there and um, I use Onyx and then I'll use Google Maps and Apple Maps. They all have like different stages yeah, of yeah. satellite images. And so I'll start pouring through satellite images um, and using that to kind of determine because like a lot of what I do is sight cast, fly fishing. Um, so I'm using that just to try to figure out where shallow, where I think the water is going to be shallow enough. Yeah. Um, and then I'll start looking at tide data for the area. And, Do you um, have an app for that too? Or? No. I, I, every time I get a good either weather app or, or tide app and I get like where I really love it and I'm like, <laughs> this is the app. We're going to go places. We're going to be together forever. <laughs> they like turn around and they're like, hey, Would you like to pay us we need $3 a month. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, but we were getting along so well. Like, <laughs> that's not how this relationship is going to work anymore. <laughs> yeah, I do hate that. And I will say that I because of that, I have like, just so many apps yeah you know because it's like like you i, I use gaia sometimes when because like you can download maps when you don't have your uh, google maps or whatever mm -hmm. you can you always have gps with the phone right right you forget that but if you have on x or gaia or something you can download Down. maps for the areas you're going uh where you might not have a service and you can still actually see where you're at on the map because yeah. you have gps yeah because i don't i don't run it i don't run an actual unit on my boat right. i just use my phone sorry getting texts from people oh. um and so that and then the other one the other app i use is windy i think wind yeah, is windy like does a fantastic a job you can see the direction you know on the map that the wind's blowing so you can get out of it or you know sometimes you like to fish a wind blowing bank and just one more real quick that i am not sponsored by but navionics app um, i don't know if you have that one no it's it is pricey it is yeah. one you have to pay for um you can i think do it annually but what i like about it is you also have some satellite imaging. It's not as good as Google Maps necessarily, but all the tide buoys are on the map. So when you know kind of this is the area I'm going to fish, yeah. you can literally find the closest tide buoy oh. and click it and get like live tide data from that tide buoy. And so that's been really key because a lot of times you're like, oh, well, what's the tide? You don't realize that the one you're checking or the one that you got the tide for yeah. is like really two hours off of what the tide is where you're at. Oh, yeah. Yep. And so uh, that's been helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like like what I'll do is I'll take take all that information, get on the water. And honestly, it's almost like speed fishing. Um, and it's one of those like if you're new to I think it's one of those like if you're new to fishing, like you're it's part of the learning curve that you're going to have to get over. But like once you've been fishing for a while, like I'm sure you can do it. Like I can roll up to a spot, fish it for 15 minutes and be like, this isn't it. Yeah. And, and you don't even really know why <laughs> you just you know. Like, yeah. I didn't somewhere. see anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so like, that's like when I'm, when I, when I am road tripping, I will not commit as hard to yeah. different locations that I've picked out that I want to try. Um, now like, if I go and fish a bank and it's an incoming tide and I don't see anything and then four hours later now we've got an outgoing tide, like, okay, I might go check it out again and see yeah, if, yeah. if the tide change helped it at all. I mean, unless I found fish somewhere. Now, like, and I've had it happen every now and then it happens um, where you roll up to your first spot and the fish are all there and everything's going <laughs> and you're like, oh, and you end up spending like a day or two in one spot. Yeah, yeah. No, I've done that. Even, even and when that happens too then you like will commit to that spot even if they're not there the next day right right like, but yeah. they we're here and everything's the same so they should still be here yeah they should still be here yeah all right um i know we're gonna wrap it up i know you got some meetings yeah i do but here, I mean, we I got five more minutes or so you got any last tips uh you know, I, again, I think just don't be afraid. I think that's the big thing. It's intimidating, and it used to be for me, but I've been doing this now for like 10 years as far as the traveling goes. And so I've kind of lost a lot of that intimidation and realized like how easy it can be. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's easy to go like, I need to get to this this one place, and you just go back there every time because you're used to it. And yeah. it's sometimes hard to say, I want to try somewhere new. And uh you know, I did that. I fished an IFA redfish tour for mm -hmm. a while. And so when I was doing that, it, I did it mostly not because of the competition, but to force me to go to new, place. to new places. And I think that is one thing that really helped me is it made me a better angler at the places that I already knew and went to. 
because I would learn things about, especially like redfish. I know you chase those a lot. It's one of my favorite species to chase. The same thing with like smallmouth bass for me. I love smallmouth bass, but fishing for them in different areas, I learned so much about the, the species mm-hmm. and the fish itself so that, you know, I can apply those things when I'm having a tough time or whatever on water that I'm actually really familiar with. Yeah. Um, so, and it's always an adventure. Like you just, you know, you never know. Um, and I think it's funny, like people ask me, like, can't believe you drove all the way to Louisiana to catch redfish and you live in North Carolina, they have redfish there. And I'm like, yeah, but it's different like it's just fun to see different places well and i've and i've learned um too like going going to those different places and even like like you're saying like you like chasing smallies like chasing redfish like like mixing up the species like yeah yeah. you know like i chase i chase redfish every day but like going out west and chasing cutthroat or going and chasing smallies like at the end of the day, like they're still fish, right? And they're going to utilize their ecosystem a little bit different. But since they're still fish, like some of the ways that they'll like use their their um, their ecosystem, you can translate and bring it back to like whatever species you love, as well as like different ways to you, to work lures through the water, yeah. different ways um, to tie like to rig everything up, different um, rods, reels, everything. Like going between those different species and different yep. places, I think like just makes you well rounded. It towards. does. And and the other, the other thing I would say about traveling, and you may agree or disagree with this, uh, it used to always be about the fish, and it still is. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that it's not about fish, but I think over the years, I've realized that if I kind of remove some of those expectations that I put on myself, like I'm going here and I gotta have this epic trip yeah. because I just spent you know 10 hours in the car and I spent all this money on gas and drug the boat and maybe something happened in the trailer and I had to fix that like now I'm here and then you don't see fish or you can't find them or whatever and it's like remove that part of it if you can and just like you're learning a new area you're you're having a new experience and you're getting to see and usually you end up meeting some cool people yeah and uh if you just kind of absorb all of that and uh then you realize it's the road trip well, maybe the driving part isn't that fun, but the actual trip itself is more than just the fishing. Right. And, and I think if you just kind of take that pressure off yourself, like I have to go catch this trophy fish or a certain fish. And I've had trips like that. I've, I've when I went to Panama, did not road trip to Panama. But <laughs> not the, to? Not, not Panama in Florida, but Panama, Panama. Yeah. And uh, we were rooster fishing. Yeah. And, uh, but we were catching other stuff. And I was down there with some guys that had never traveled out of the country, right? So they had to get their passports to go. Um, and one guy had never been gone more than three days away from his house. Like, so he was completely out of his element, right? Um, 100% out of his element. Like, he was freaking out because he had beef jerky. And it says, you know, did you yeah. bring any food into the country? And he's like, I can't enter. I, I got food. And I'm like, it's freaking packaged beef jerky, man. Chill. You're going to throw it away. Yeah. You're gonna, it's fine. And so, anyway... I was down there with one goal, to catch a nice rooster fish. Mm-hmm. I caught some, but they were small. I wanted a big one. The whole entire trip, everyone's catching rooster fish. I'm not catching. And I'm right in the middle of it, right? I'm right with them. I'm doing everything the same. For whatever reason, I could not. This wasn't your trip. Them. No, and I look over at him, and every single fish that he catches, whether it's like a tiny trigger fish or this giant rooster fish, he is ecstatic because every single fish was a new species for him yeah and it was a new experience the whole thing was a new experience i had been there before and so i i forgot about that part of it and i was so focused on that one fish that i'm like having terrible time for like the first day and then i watch him and i realized like it just i don't know it spoke to me i saw him just having a like great time hollering every time he caught a small tiny fish yeah he was just like this is the best trip ever you know and then I'm like, I'm in Panama, like, <laughs> with people that are so excited to be here all around me, and I'm ruining it because I put these stupid expectations. And then you know what happened after I kind of removed all that? I finally actually caught a rooster fish. But, you know, it was like I was trying too hard. And so don't do that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I 100% agree with that. Um, I mean, if you think about it, like, if you go on a week-long fishing trip, say, you know, f- yeah, five days, like, you might fish... 12 hours a day, 8 to 12 hours a day like you're eating you're traveling like there's so much more that goes on into a trip and and I've I've honestly like it's only been in the last probably six months that I've started having more of that mindset on my road trips of like you know just like look where we are 
Yeah, just send you're it. You're like, this is awesome. <laughs> it, I mean, it really is a big difference, uh, and it's made a big difference in my just yeah. mentality. And honestly, I probably catch more fish. Yeah. Uh, when I'm just not relaxed. Yeah, when I'm not trying to like put that that high level of expectation or pressure on myself, which is also why I stopped fishing tournaments because you know that was the the pressure part of it to do well at the tournament took the fun out of the traveling. Yeah. Me. Um, so anyway, that's what that's what I got. Awesome. <laughs> All right, guys, there you go. There's some tips for getting on the road. Um, check out the Road Trip Angler. Where's it at? So you can, you can watch Road Trip Angler on YouTube, and then uh, the television show airs on Bally Sports Networks nationwide. So whatever your local Bally Sports channel is, you can check for Road Trip Angler on the schedule. Like I said, we just started airing uh, the second season, so it's kind of splattered around all over their networks um, at different times. So. And then what's your, you're on Instagram Yeah, Jam also? Jameson Redding on okay. Instagram, Jameson Redding Fishing on Facebook. So there you go. You got a big Facebook group? No, nah, we, <laughs> I, I got like 4,000 friends on MySpace. <laughs> but, um. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time this morning. Um, if you guys listening in, check, check Jameson out. If you guys are watching on YouTube, hit like, hit subscribe. If you are listening on Spotify or Apple or any of those other podcast networks, leave a five-star review, say something nice or don't. Um, yeah, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, too.